All right. So uh, welcome to uh, Clay is a Four Letter Word, Kevin. Thanks yeah. for uh, coming on and doing my thing. Cheers. It's great. Yeah, cheers. It's a nice cup you got there. Uh, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> is this from your MFA? My MA show, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't have the F. Oh, that's right. I just, have the, I just have the MA, but it's okay. That's like, okay. It's all right. I remember going to your show and, and seeing that wall of mugs, and I'm like, these are so good. I got to have one, so I picked this one yeah. up. Yeah. I love it. It's cool that you still have it and you still use it. Yeah. So uh, thanks for doing this with me. I know this is my third one. I, I'll give you credit for helping me with the name because originally I was going to call it uh, a clay art podcast and yeah. clay was a four-letter word. It was like the little tagline. And you're like, that's the name. I'm like, you're right. That is the name. Yeah. So I'm happy that. So <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I appreciate sure. that. Um, so I guess I guess a little background to give everybody a little background about the two of us. Like when we've known each other since what? Spring semester of 2002. Is that right? It could the be, yeah, Fullerton? two, two, three, yeah. Uh -huh. 2002, 2000, yeah. So, Cal State Fullerton, 2002, Vince Suez, 306A or 306B, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. That was the class. If, if I had a great memory, I'd, I'd yeah, really I'm, be I'm, coming I, up with all those. It's things. 306A and 306B. That was the class. Okay. So, yeah. So, it's cool to kind of like, it's been cool to, for us together to kind of have this journey as we've both kind of been doing ceramics for a long time and. There's you and a couple other people who I still keep in contact with who are like the OG ceramics people. So yeah. it's cool that we're now we're doing this and it's I love cool it. to see we're doing that. I love so it. so like wherever you want to start, but like what's your story and like how did this whole ceramics thing come to be for you? Yeah, so the beginning starts in high school and we're both high school ceramics teachers, so um, it makes sense for us. Uh, it it started in high school. I I've walked into the class and uh, Dennis Boucher was my ceramics teacher. And uh, I looked at the wheel and I said, Mr. Boucher, I got to do that. I got to be on that. And he's like, all right, all right, you know, do some tiles and some hand building. And, and so finally I got on the wheel and it just, it was just exactly where I wanted to be. And so I, I took that for two years, graduated, moved on to um, junior college, uh, decided that ceramics was what I wanted to teach, or at least art is what I wanted to teach. And, and then, did you go to junior college? So I went to junior college at Irvine Valley Junior College, uh, but they didn't have a ceramics program. So there were two years where I, I wasn't in clay. Um, and then I went to Orange Coast College uh, in California, and uh, they were transitioning into this new facility. So I had one semester in this old facility, learned how to raku and and... Uh, really just kind of fell in love with clay again and then moved into the brand new facility which was incredible then transferred to Cal State Fullerton and that's where I met you and uh, that that transition was amazing I think the first year we went to Enseca yeah uh, that's San Diego in San Diego yeah, yeah, yeah. and like the ceramics dude it was paid, overwhelming yeah, like, paid so, for it all there's other but it was like remember my first Enseca was like Dude, there's a bunch of people that are just as much into clay as, yes. as we are. Like, yeah. Because it feels, it feels like it's my life as a ceramic artist. It does feel, like I said in this last one, it feels like a bubble. People are like, you do ceramics? Yeah. You do pottery? Like I show up places with clay on me, they're like, what do you do? Like, do you do drywall? I'm like, no, I do ceramics. <laughs> like pottery? Like ghosts? I'm like, yep, yeah, that's, that's it. what I do. Yeah. But whatever. Yeah, so that was my exposure to the larger ceramic world, and it just blew my mind. That was just, yeah, completely overwhelming. Yeah. And even going to, like, Enseca now is still yeah. overwhelming, but at least I kind of know some people there and and just kind of understand the, the process of that big event. Um, and then I graduated, uh, and I had my teaching credential, and I was going to get into my my student teaching, which is where I'm kind of in the classroom and practicing everything that we learned, decided that I wanted to spend a year abroad and do something different before I jumped into a career. And so I, I got on a plane to Taiwan and taught English to third grade students there, <laughs> sold everything I had and just kind of just moved there with no expectation just to experience the culture and experience uh, a different uh, way of living. Uh, walked into a ceramic artist, um, it was a studio downstairs and then his living uh, was upstairs. And I sat down at this table, had a cup of tea, and before you knew it, I was already, I was taking classes. And, and so I was back in clay, even on the other side of the world. Uh, it definitely influenced the way that I threw, uh, the way that I thought about uh, pots and um, it was just a great experience. And so I bring that back into the classroom. So then I, I came back and 
did my student teaching, got a job, and now I'm here at Esperanza High School teaching um, five periods of ceramics in this amazing facility. So that's where we are right now. Um, maybe and, we'll do a tour. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, after, yeah, we'll do a tour. Um, and it just happened to be in the same district that, you know, Ryan yeah. teaches at. And well, we taught at the same school for, what, two years? That's right, years. we were. Yeah. We were there for two years we together. Were trying to get into ceramics, and we were stuck doing art fundamentals and 3D art. And yeah, you got to do what you got to do. I knew that this. I knew this district really had opportunities yeah. for both of us, and and it has panned out. It's been really great. Yeah. So you got your teaching job at Esperanza. You got, and you've been kind of. So we started here when two thousand. When when did 11, I start at here. Esperanza? Two thousand. Yeah, 11, 10. 12, ten. Yeah. So and then not, it's been I the last like what five, three, or four years. Your kind of personal strength mm -hmm. career has really taken off. So what really was the catalyst was we were, my wife and I were living in a condo and I was working here and I didn't really feel comfortable, you know, starting a ceramic uh, career, like my own art personal side at a school. And so I wanted a, my own studio. And so that was like a conversation my wife and I had, you know, let's, let's buy a house that has a garage where I can turn it into a studio. So we, we transitioned into a home garage, set up the studio, and then um, I was just exploring, like, what is my voice, what is my style, and I discovered soda firing and mocha diffusion kind of at the same time, and I was looking really for surface decorations, new ideas for my high school ceramics class, and I was on Instagram kind of posting every day, just kind of new things, testing the water, seeing what was happening. Um, I posted a little video of Mocha Diffusion and just kind of that that green drop spreading and yeah, diffusing. Fireworks. Yeah. Fireworks. I just think it's, look at it, I'm like, it looks like fireworks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, fireworks. It's totally. That's all. That's whenever I look at your mm -hmm. stuff, your videos, I'm like, it's like 4th of July to me. That's interesting. I mean, that's kind of how I see it. It's just a little, mm -hmm. the drop. Yeah, and it just It's just like explodes. when the thing goes up and then it explodes. It's just kind of like you just For drop sure. it. And then, yeah. But it stays. It stays. Yeah. You get a, yeah, really capture the... The moment. That's like capturing uh -huh. a moment. Yeah. Which that's what's really amazing about it. That's a good it, description. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Hey. Put, that <laughs> your, put that on your website. Um, so when did you start doing Mocha Diffusion? Like when did that soda firing Mocha Diffusion thing happen? Yeah, it was at the same time, kind of like parallel stream. So I was discovering was like both 2015? techniques. 2015, sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll say that. But um, your daughter was born, right? Yep. It's funny how your, your kind of career... Kind of took off yeah. when your kid was born, yeah. and then mine. Not that mine's taken off yet, but I really started getting more serious. Yeah, I, I kind of made when my kids were born, and I don't know if that has something. If like having the, the kids makes us like, oh, what now did I we have... do before we had kids? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Where'd all that time go? What were we do, wasting our time? I don't know. So yeah, once you had a, once I have a kid, all of a sudden I'm like motivated yeah. about like trying all these new things and yeah. running a business and. That's the same. It's weird because it's the yeah. same. I kind of look back. I'm like, yeah. first, my first kid was kind of, I kind of was started. But mm -hmm. then when my second kid was born, who's yeah. just turned two, like 2017, when I moved into my new house, that's when I really was like, okay, now I'm actually going to get serious. Yeah. And I don't know. Maybe it's the kids like motivating, like I need to get away from them. Or maybe it's like, <laughs> or maybe it's like Getting I need to provide more for them. Yeah. It's like this, I don't know. There's just something that clicked. Instinct I, we have. Honestly. It was a. It was not just the kid having the kid. Right. That's part of like the personality element of it, and and like kind of like responsibility element. But I think Periscope, Instagram, live video, um, connecting to the greater ceramic community through those social media platforms really uh, inspired me to just keep pursuing what I was pursuing. Good. So that kind of goes into my next question. Yeah. So uh, I feel like you've done really well with social media. Mm -hmm. I feel like social media has probably helped you oh, yeah. grow to kind of where you are mm -hmm. and like having videos that are, are appeal to a broader audience than just ceramics. Yeah. Seems to be helpful for a lot of... Hashtag satisfying videos. Satisfying, <laughs> ASMR satisfying yeah. videos. So how do you think Instagram or social media, I guess we shouldn't say just Instagram, yeah. but social media social in general... Media. How do you think it's like changed your like art practice, like the way you make art? Mm. Does that like, do you consider like, oh, like I'm going to shoot a video today or do your videos become like spontaneously like this is a mm -hmm. good idea? Or? 
at first Periscope was the, the thing that pushed me into my studio because that community at that time, we were watching each other's videos. We were producing videos, live videos. It was like having a group of people in your studio. And right. so I wanted to go, get out to my studio and make so I could hang out with these yeah. friends and get their feedback and show them what I was doing. And so that, that really forced me into the studio. And once you're in the studio, you're making and making, making, you're coming up with the product. Yeah. And, and I remember saying like, okay, now I can start selling. And then once you start selling your work, it kind of like pushes work out the door so you can make more yeah. work. And it validates what you're doing because what you're doing is yeah. has value to somebody else. Yeah. Cause I have, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of work that I've made that just kind of sits, I, <laughs> but you if know, I have older work, like my newer work, I'm like, Oh, we have to throw away a lot of pottery or give yeah. away a lot of pottery, yeah. um, in, in our field. And that makes sense. And I always say, if I give away one pot, it, I, it always comes back some, some For way, sure. like yeah. someone will tell someone and, and maybe it'll turn into a sale or, it's just more exposure. So I'm, I'm cool with giving away pots. Throwing yeah. away bad pots is very uh, therapeutic. Oh, and sure. I just did a huge Smash purge. Parties. Smash party. Oh, it's so great. To empty a shelf and then, you know, have that ready. Oh, social media. Yeah. So that Periscope, Periscope got me kind of motivated to get into the studio. And, and my wife and I, I mean, if, we, if I want to be honest, we had many of conversations about like, you know, is my time in the studio more important than my relationship with her? And I'm sure that at times it did seem like it was more important, but it, it, the long run, of course not. It was just a transition. It was like my wife and I were used to spending all the time together. And now all of a sudden I'm starting this pottery business and I'm not, something has to, to give. And so spending a little bit of time in the studio late at night, um, it, it was, it was a change in, in our routine and our norm, but we figured things out and we kind of created a schedule and, yeah. and then things change. You have one child and then we moved and then we had a, right. two children. And, and so now it's, I think, um, social media is just a way to connect with the broader audience and where I'm at right now, I feel like I, I have to post and that's kind of frustrating um, because I want to continue the, the momentum, but that shouldn't the be working momentum in the studio or just both or the momentum, on you know, the even w even when I'm not working in the studio, I feel like I have to post something and you I think post that, you don't post every day. I try and post every day and I do that because it's the same, like I want to get into the studio. I want to get into that environment. I want to, I want to kind Stay of connected. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what social media is. Like yeah. you're connecting with people. I'm, I don't use it to only sell pots. I use it as a documentation yeah. um, to see my progress, um, see what other people are doing, connecting, yeah. comment. Steal people's ideas. Yeah. Like philosophies. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. I wouldn't be polishing my bottoms if I didn't see other people right. polishing their bottoms. Yeah. Listening to people explain like, mm -hmm. yeah, polish your bottoms. And it's like, oh. So yeah, I think that... Um, you know, ceramics is such a community medium, and we grow up in this in schools and communities, and mm -hmm. then we go off into our own studios. Yeah. So, social media is definitely, I think, the the glue that can keep us connected, even if we're all in our own little. I studios. would say, if social media wasn't a part of my practice, it would be very hard for me to continue uh, making pottery, if that makes sense. So, I would still teach. But I think my passions would go other places. Social media allows us to have that high school, college, uh, residency experience in in the in your studio because yeah. you get feedback, you get to share community. You you yeah. have community yeah. and a very private practice. Yeah. So if that makes sense. Oh I, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I feel the same way. It's like we're in our own little garages or basements yeah. or studios by ourselves, but we want to be with other people. But we're at the point of our lives and as artists that well, we're not in school, we're not students, we can't yeah. do residencies for weeks or months at a time because we're... Yeah, we have responsibilities. Kids, kids, kids are... Kids are... Kids change your life, you know? Yeah. Kids completely change your priorities. And anybody that has kids will probably tell you. So what about like your time management on social media? Do you spend mm -hmm. a lot of time on social media? Do you ever like look at the little timer and see how many hours a day you've been on 
I try not to use the metrics or like the, the analytics uh, very often because then I can just get wrapped up in like, oh, I'm spending too much time or I'm not spending enough time or I'm not getting enough likes or, you know, it, it just turns into a chore and and it doesn't seem fun that way. It's cool to go look at the analytics every once in a while just to get a, a understanding of it. But I don't use those as a guide to posting and right. like time it management. Dictate what you my relationship with my family and my wife is the kind of... Um, it just helps me stay uh, balanced. Yeah. That, that's it's like your foundation. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, going back to how we're saying, like, with you and, like, you had to kind of, like, have a conversation with your wife about, like, I need to do this. Yeah. And I think it's, like, there's a certain part of, I feel like maybe when I had kids, it was really, like, no, I need, I need something for myself. So much of it is yeah. like going to work yeah. and, like, going and doing, like, family time. Mm -hmm. It's, like, it's, like, it's like for everybody else. It's for everybody else. It's yeah. Like taking care of it, like being a caretaker, giving, taking, which is awesome. But at the same time, especially hmm. if you've gone for, you know, 30 something years of your life as being like, I take care of myself. Okay, now I take care of my wife. Like, now I got to take care of these kids. I know for me, I think part of it was like, I need something for myself. Mm -hmm. Like, I need to keep my own identity of like, I yeah. still need to be Ryan. I can't just be Papa or. Yeah, there the for sure. The, wife. the conversation with my wife uh, was that was part of it. I I want to develop my own personal creativity, yeah. and so that Even was as that, like Kevin that was it. Not, it I, you know, I'm teacher, I'm husband, right. I'm Your father. Um, I definitely needed a, a voice in in a yeah. creative outlet, and, and you know, part of it was being creative as a teacher learning how to teach uh the first like five or six yeah. years that you pour a lot of creativity into that like mm -hmm. okay i gotta show up every day i gotta figure out how am i gonna manage the classroom how am i gonna teach this lesson and, and it interesting you get, get to a point students you get to a point where you're like okay i've been creative i made these amazing lessons i've made this uh great studio work and flow but then you stop kind of pouring that creativity as much into it and so you have more creativity to add to your own personal work and so yeah. that's that's what i was feeling it's a good good way to like look back and see that yeah. that i i had more creative out I, I needed another creative outlet yeah and your own i think teaching you know teaching it's like we do the same projects every year yeah it's like okay we're gonna go back and we're gonna do pinch pots and we're mm -hmm. gonna do pole pots and we're gonna do slabs and yeah it's awesome. It's grueling. It kind of, it's, it's grueling, yeah. but at the same time, it keeps it like it keeps our us our skills. But it's like we need to do our own stuff. Like, yeah. I can't just do demos all day. Like I need to do my. I didn't get into ceramics to be a teacher. I got into ceramics because I like making things out of clay. And then I realized like, oh, I can teach. It's fun to teach. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like I started doing ceramics because I like I like making things. So mm -hmm. it's nice to kind of be able to be artists and, and do what we do, and you know. Be our own individual selves. Um, another thing I noticed is that you're, you know, you're pretty, you're pretty, um, you're pretty well rooted in mocha diffusion as your process. But it's been cool to see how you've been like experimenting with other things. Mm -hmm. So how has that process been of like trying to do the the seascapes and the I don't know what other scapes you have. But yeah. I know you're doing like other. I know you're experimenting with other kind of yeah parts of it. How's that? How's that process been to kind of develop? Or where do you find your uh, those new ideas? So I I built a soda kiln, and that was one of the projects where I needed to expand my creative outlet and and just kind of like make something new so I can have a different process. And with the kiln, there was some kind of different parts in the kiln where I wanted to put different pieces, and so I tried glazes, and they started running and, and creating these really beautiful the temperature differences. Yeah, the temperature atmosphere. and just more. Uh, um, soda build up in that area um, and so I was starting to glaze and then I saw other people putting a bunch of different glazes on their pots and I was like I want to try that and see if I can achieve the same look in a, kind of cosmic in a, yeah cosmic <laughs> yes lots yeah. of layers of glazes and I yeah, just yeah. used the glazes I had um, some that are commercial some that are um, things I found online and mixed up but I just used the glazes I had and I achieved an effect that I was really happy with. Um, 
And so expanding my, my line of work, I think is important to just stay fresh and creative. Yeah. And sometimes I'm going to go down this road and it's not going to lead anywhere successful, but it will at least, you know, I'll use that creative energy and, and then just experiences to add to your tool belt. Yeah. And, and honestly, I've been, I've been wanting to do a whole nother body of work and it's just kind of slowly getting there kind of more sculptural, more, uh, uh texture, and I'm teaching a workshop at Clay by the Bay in San Francisco, and it's all about kind of instant pottery or surface decorations. And obviously Mocha Diffusion was that first like instant pottery mm -hmm. decoration that I really fell in love with. And then I've realized, oh, there's so many other techniques that I could use in my pottery. Um, I, I like the, the quickness of that surface decoration. And so I wanted to find more that were similar. Mm -hmm. um, carving and drawing and painting, those things, I, I, I think a lot of people do them well. Mm -hmm. And it does take a lot of time to get there. But I wanted to develop some other surface decorations that were more instant that would. Exciting or yeah, the process be, is more exciting? Yeah, be exciting show to show it, to teach it to high school students yeah. because they want that, like, they want a microwave um, oh, yeah. decoration. They want to push a button and be like, ah, here it is. Yeah. So pushing myself to, to come up with that. Um, so, yeah, expanding my my line of work. And just as teachers, we I want to give as many opportunities to my students. So I need to develop them personally. I, yeah. I need to, like, know what I'm talking about to show my students how to do this. And and I, I think that they can sense like, oh, you've never really tried that. I'm not going to put in the effort to keep trying it myself. So th there's that aspect of it. Yeah, I was teaching them the like image transfer thing the first time, mm -hmm. like a year or two ago with like the, you know, the photo. Yeah, yeah, the right. Xerox, mm -hmm. The Xerox kind of thing and I was doing it. Didn't like, work. Yeah, guys. <laughs> Let me try. Let me try this demo again tomorrow yeah. or next week. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely a. Thing. You got to know your your stuff when you're trying to teach it to yeah. anyone. Or just be super transparent. I, I've had to be super transparent from showing kids something that yeah. I don't know that much about. I'll be like, yep. well, like, so if one example is is like Mocha Diffusion. I've had kids who see you on Instagram. They're yeah. like, oh, this is really cool. Like, how do we do? It this? looks so easy. Let's just yeah. drop it on there. And, and it's like, oh, like, well, I kind of understand the basic concept of mm -hmm. like okay we need to have a wet slip we need to have a an acidic so I just, what i got windex or yeah. whatever i have in the right. like cabinet like that's what that's what you get and then here's some like iron oxide like go for it or bubble glazing and i'm like ah, yeah i've seen the video like sure let's try <laughs> bubble glazing and, which is kind of fun because it forces me to like i wouldn't I wouldn't have any interest in doing bubble glazing or milk diffusion if i didn't have kids that were like how do we do this so i'm like okay well then i'm gonna have to like Experiment. So that's one thing the awesome things about teaching high school is that it keeps us like jack of all trades. We have to kind of be diverse and we have to be flexible and we have to be kind of well versed in many processes and techniques. So um, so now your you know ceramics kind of business or your pottery things going well, what do you like five to ten years from now, like what do you where do you want to see wow, yourself? Five like, year five, plan. like what's your five years of like What's Kowalski Pottery doing in five years? Pottery. Yeah. <laughs> Ceramics, clay. Um, I think just kind of expanding. It's so funny because Mocha Diffusion is a great um, analogy for my life. It kind of starts at a point and then just it just spread. And just with social media as well. Like yeah. you have to start somewhere. You have to make that first post. And then all of a sudden people like it or they don't like it or they share it. Yeah. So it's, it's a... It's a cool analogy to, for my own experience. Yeah. Um, but I definitely want to spread my wings and kind of like, or, or spread out and, and find more opportunities. So um, doing different things on social media, um, updating my website to really kind of like capture everything that's happening, um, make it a hub for uh, where you can find my work and where you can find videos. Um, just exploring new techniques, new ideas. I would like to workshop more. Uh, traveling and doing workshops is so fun. And that's that's one thing that I've tried to maintain. I, I try and at least have four a year where I can go to different places and, and workshop and teach. 
Um, but you have, so you have one coming up in. Yeah, so in September I'm doing one in uh, San at San Francisco Clay by the Bay. It's my second time I've done it, That's and cool. trying to do it a little different than just the Milk and Fusion. But yeah. uh, they have such an amazing group and facility. Um, I was just there with my wife this past weekend, just visiting vacation and walk in and it's just so cool yeah they're always doing something new and changing things around and they have great professor or great uh teachers and and great just a good vibe yeah there. it's cool uh, but five ten years man I, I don't know if i could think that far ahead do you want to get more like in the galleries and kind of like that kind of academic -y side of ceramics or do you want to just do you want to do more like um like, like uh, booths and sales and like a, and those kind of? I, I always stayed away from hauling my work and setting it up somewhere it and spending a whole day. It, <laughs> it does suck. There are people that are very successful at it and very uh, good at it. Not here in Southern California. But where we are, there's very few opportunities. I think more and more are coming up. But Then we got to go to L.A. You got to yeah. go to L.A. You got to go to like the beach. Yeah. And where we are, it's like. I think that buy that for the five dollars. I think that we've we'll set up it. a good presence online where we can just kind of sell it from the yeah. comfort of our home, yeah. and I'm not selling, you know, a ton of work from uh, social media or that, but I'm selling enough where it kind of it it allows me to continue to work and, and make more and make more and, and make more and there'll be an audience. To yeah. So take them off the shelves. And like I said, that. The time with my family and my my wife and my kids really dictates what I kind of jump into. So if I'm going to go spend a weekend away from them, uh, selling at a booth somewhere, it, it does take away from time with family. Yeah. Workshops, I'm trying to make it so that I can take my family with yeah. me and turn it into a, a family vacation. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I try and bring my wife along, and if not the kids, so. So the, those things are, it's always a checks and check and balance of, of spending time with my family and, and making sure that I'm, you know, balanced. Um, what kind of the dumb question I've been asking everybody, like, mm -hmm. have you had any major ceramics, um, like disasters? Like any, like, have you ever had like, you know, it was a like hundred hours mm -hmm. of work in a kiln and you blow everything up or? I feel like a ceramic artist, we're like really good at making mistakes. Mm -hmm. Not that we intentionally are trying to like screw ourselves, mm -hmm. but just the process is so. Yeah. You know. What one that I that sticks out to me it was in college, and I was making these like Vulcus inspired platters, and so they were kind of thicker. They were really kind of expressionistic and just kind of fun, and and I put them into the kiln to bis fire, and I was so excited to get them out that I kind of cranked the heat a little oh, too yeah. fast and I remember even my professor was like interested in like what I was doing and I was excited about it and all of a sudden you hear this like pop pop and it was just it was a good learning experience because you're in ceramics you're very anxious to get to the next stage and I think that taught me slow down and also have multiple things going so you're not just focused hyper focused on one thing like the firing Right. If I were like working on some other pots in the in the studio, I, I don't think I would have cranked it up as fast. Right. I was just kind of focused, focused, focused. So that was one thing that I learned from, and uh, that that I would try not to repeat. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I think we've all blown stuff up. Yeah, education most, most of us have through that is is really important. Um, have, you, have you had any bad experiences with a teacher where you like ruined a bunch of student work or? I haven't. Um, yeah, knock on wood. I did load a kiln and I was shifting the shelves around and all of a sudden things shifted and fell onto me, but I caught everything, but nobody was there. So I kind of had to like take pieces yeah. down and take shelves down. I think I only broke four or five pieces, which is a lot. I mean, that's four or five students that worked hours on projects, but uh, it could have been way more disastrous. Yeah. So I, I try and slow down my process and slow down my loading and unloading so that I can I can have successful firings. Yeah. And having students help is is important because then you're teaching them how to do it. Yeah. And it, that teaching process slows everything down. Yeah. Patience. Yeah. Patience. Um have you had any injuries? Ceramics mm -hmm. injuries? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, talk about your. I don't know if I want to equate it to only pottery. It was probably accumulation of playing volleyball, uh, lifting and throwing uh, on the potter's wheel, lifting heavy kiln shells. But uh, there was a point in my life where I had really bad sciatic pain down my right leg. And I had gone to the chiropractor multiple times. And then I left for Taiwan. And I was in Taiwan and I just, I couldn't walk anymore. It was just that painful. I went to a doctor there. And you were in your 20s, right? Yeah, I was 20s? 25. Yeah. Um, and they took a CAT scan and they said, you need to be in surgery. And I was like, no, I'm not going to have a surgery in Taiwan. And then I went to another doctor and they said the same exact thing. And I was like, are you sure? So the doctor that I got connected with uh, had studied at UCLA and uh, other places. He, he was like, I do the surgery like five times a day. <laughs> he was so confident. Yeah. And it's like, Brushing my teeth. Yeah, and I was I was at a point in my life where I was like, God, how are you going to heal me? Like, I, I need healing in my body right now. And, like, it was clear that the doctor was that, that point of healing. And it was really cool because after this the surgery, Taiwan. yeah, in Taiwan, after the surgery, I woke up and no pain, no sciatic pain, uh, just from the, you know, surgery because they right. had to drill, yeah. cut through bones and yeah. stuff. So it was a sciatic, uh, um, oh, shoot, what was it? Dys dysectomy, I think, was the correct term between my L4 and L5. And it was bulging and it was pushing on my sciatic nerve. And so they had just had to remove the bulge. Woke up pain free. Um, and then for the next, like, I think six, seven months, I had dinner with my doctor and his family um, once a month and just built this really cool relationship. And, and, so those things I'm grateful for, it, it worked out. Yeah. Um, but now I'm very conscious of, of sitting and, and, and standing and throwing properly. Yeah. I try and get lighter shelves so I don't have to you know, yeah, carry yeah. things the up. Long, the long term. And then I started standing up or uh, staying higher uh, when I'm working. So I will sit on a tall stool with the, the wheel kind of almost at my chest level yeah. so I'm not bending over. And then I try and you make. Throw standing up, or you sit. You it's sit kind of a, a high wheel. Yeah, it's kind of like a stool, like a taller okay. stool that I'm like leaning against. Yeah. It's not like where I'm standing perfectly straight. And yeah, you need your wheel like over here. To yeah. So I just kind of build my studio around my height, and it, it t typically works out for everything, everyone in my um, classroom because we have taller stools, and it's just easier because then I don't have to bend over. Yeah. Um, and. So I don't move people's, you know, stuff like housing and I don't lift heavy boxes. So there's always things that I'm conscious about. All right. Do you want to give your phone? Hmm. Oh, My you phone is there. I can just I can just show you here so you can read it. Yeah, sure. But first one is from Paul Ide at 945. Ooh, Paul Ide, what's and up? He asked you, uh, have you ever seen a Henway? <laughs> Uh, what's a Henway? About three pounds. That's good, Paul. I like that. I'm glad you spent lots of time thinking about, you know, good questions to ask him. Can you read the next one? Yeah. I'll read it so I can. Uh, SP Pottery, with two Y's, SP underscore Pottery, it says, how old were you and how did you start with ceramics? Which you kind of got into, but. Yeah, so 17, uh, my junior year of high school. And I, I say that I've been working in clay for 21 years, even though there was those two years of not working in clay, but it's easier to do math. Yeah. I mean, Just, once you start and if you're still doing it, it's like. So 1997 is when I first touched clay and I fell in love with it. Next one so is from RD Ceramics. Yeah. Um, and Brian, right? Brian, yeah. And he asks, how have. Uh, how have the workshops you teach come about or do they reach out to you? Yeah, so workshops, I, uh, I like the idea that people and communities generate enough interest in what I do that they reach out to me and they want me to come and do a workshop. So I, I don't throw out a bunch of feelers and like ask, it, you know, can I be a workshop, you know, teacher there? So I, I let them uh, generate the interest because those are always the best, um, like, well-attended, I guess, is because there's people interested. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to go to a place and then, oh, 
what's mocha diffusion? Right. I don't know. Um, it's so, not worth it for them if people don't show up. Right. I, I don't want to try and sell myself at a place. Um, so workshops have come about that way, kind of naturally, organically. And I, I love that. I, I'm always willing to do a workshop anywhere. Um, this last in Sika, um, a guy from Russia came and um, came to our room show and, and he was like, oh, I want you to come out to Russia. And I was like, uh, if we can make that happen, I will be there. Nothing has come of it, but it just that idea, like I'm willing to travel awesome. anywhere to do a workshop and, and learn uh, from the local community and, and teach yeah, as well. Just cool experiences. Yeah. I mean, it's a good excuse to travel. Workshopping has, has been amazing. I think that I enjoy workshopping out more than teaching because you go to a place and these people are, are students are really interested in right. what you're teaching. And so you have full attention. Whereas at high school, you're trying to teach them things and trying to like create buy-in and, and like it's different. engagement. It's a daily thing. Yeah. It's like a daily thing. That yes. Kind of forced more or less to go to school. Yeah. But I also know that there's downfalls to workshopping because you can't teach everything in one or two days right. in a couple hour demo. Yeah. So I have to have different versions of my workshop. Right. So like a two hour demo is different than a three day workshop. So, so I'm developing that and, and I've been talking with people who do workshops a lot. So Michael Klein is like my, my mentor in that and, and we kind of go back and forth and talk about how how we've workshopped and um, what is successful works. And, and so I think with anything, having a community, so people that workshop and teach workshops, having a community to develop, um, support, support kind of and questions. talk. Yeah. Cause yeah, it's like we're doing these things as artists that we share the artists doing, but if we've never done it, it's kind of like, uh, um, am I doing this right? Yeah. So. And I, when I first <laughs> workshopped, it was like, okay, well, I've been to workshops. I've seen people workshop. And so I just emulated that. But it wasn't really me. I, I like more audience interaction. And the ones that I've been to is just kind of the artist talking at mm -hmm. you the whole time. And, and I don't know. I like hands-on. I like interaction and questions and getting to know the participants and people that are taking the workshop. So that's kind of where I'm heading and gearing my, my workshops. Cool. It's a good question. Another one from Ryan, RD Ceramics. Mm -hmm. um, how does teaching on ClayShare different from teaching in person? Oh yeah, talk ClayShare. About ClayShare a little bit. So ClayShare is great. ClayShare.com. That's a good plug. Um, I am an instructor on that platform, and Jessica Phillip, uh, Putnam Phillips, uh, does a great job of creating an online community that you can um, watch videos, tutorials. There's also a live aspect of it every Wednesday. Um, she has done an amazing job. So she asked uh, me to be a, an instructor. And so I film videos for the, the people that purchase um, a subscription. So how is it different? I'm talking at a camera. <laughs> There's no one else in the room. Um, I have to think about everything I say and, and every movement I make and I have to edit and uh, it's you edit all the videos. Those yeah, yourself. it's a difficult process. I think I, at this point I have eight videos and it's taken a lot of time to make those eight videos. Um, how is it different than teaching high school? Is that uh, how does teaching, how does teaching on ClayShare differ, differ, differ from teaching in person? Oh yeah. So it's just me in a studio. I, I wish there's no back and forth. There's no back and forth. I, I do. I would like to have more people in the room or um, a part of the, the video uh, editing and all that stuff, but I can't at this point pay someone to do it um, yeah. or help me out. Probably could find interns, but teaching in person is my preference. Yeah. I enjoy it. Even teaching live videos, which is still you in a studio, but there's some comments, there's questions, there's people watching. Flow. There's definitely a flow. And the flow is different when you're in person. Yeah. You can... And what it comes down to is me giving myself grace um, or like kind of like the, I don't know. Yeah. Grace. Cause I'm going to say something live and I can, I don't know, change or, or add to it or, uh, give a different, um, Expand and yeah. Kind of pontificate. And, there you go. <laughs> uh, but when I'm doing a recording, I, I just feel very robotic 
And that's one of the comments that came back is like, just be a little bit more personable. Like, it's hard. It's hard when you're in your garage by yourself. Like doing this, man. when I'm doing yeah. the interviews, it's fine. Easy. We're just talking. And then I was doing like the intros and outros. And, and you're like, like, hi, I am a robot. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know what just, I'm doing. It's just different. <laughs> but it's, you know, I guess as we yeah. do it more, we get more comfortable. And so I'm adding to my, my repertoire of like, um, uh, of things that I'm good at. And now acting is one of them because I have to perform and act. As teachers, I feel like we're actors. Yeah. To a certain degree. But then this. But it's a live like, audience. Yeah. It's, it's like theater. Mm-hmm. And now you're doing commercials or like TV. Yeah. yeah and there's no director or producer no. behind the camera telling me, oh, say it this way. Or you, let's let me move the camera so you, I yeah. can get a better angle. So there's a lot of production that I have to maintain and do all on my own. Yeah. Um, so I don't. It's it's difficult. It's just a, a skill that I'm learning. Yeah, and I think the more you do it, the better it gets. Yeah, it's just it's good skills to have to have these in the yes. 21st century. These like being well, versatile, and I can communicate yeah. in different mediums, and I know how to like put things together. And yeah, cool is a way that people can understand. As teachers, I feel like that's a you know, so like the whole flipped classroom thing, where teachers are literally like teaching their lessons mm-hmm. and then posting it, and then Google Classroom kids watch their lessons like. Yeah. I haven't done it yet, but I've considered like, oh, I should just videotape all my demos and then put it on. Yeah. Like, and that was a motivating thing for Clayshare is like, okay, well now this is motivating me because I'm going to semi get paid for it. Um, as, as long as people watch them. Um, now I have this like bank of, of videos that I could use and maybe you, in my classroom yeah. and that I could share and show. But even that, like students want to see you do it live. Yeah. Maybe they can reference it later, which is helpful. Yeah. But here's, yeah, yeah, yeah. here's the thing I want to, like maybe transition into saying go check out Clayshare. For sure, <laughs> check out Clayshare. Clayshare. Clayshare.com. And you right tell there, me you, Clayshare.com. you can be <laughs> you can be the critic of of how how it looks and, and how it and it's a flows. subscription based yeah. service. So. I don't think I personally have any free options or like free videos that you can watch. I think you watch the intros, but Jessica has um, a a library of free options that you can go try them out and okay. see but it's a, a if you're in your own studio alone it's a good place to learn new techniques and and start to have a community so cool clayshare.com clayshare.com and then what ryan asked rd ceramics asked one more question mm-hmm. um would you continue soda firing if you didn't have access to one at your school studio oh yeah, the reason why I do soda fire is because I built a small little kiln at my school. Little experimental Frankenstein kiln. So right? would I still do soda firing if I didn't have it at my school? I would probably build it at my house. Yeah, it's so propane. yeah, I would. I, the first one was propane, right? It was propane because yeah, at that point I didn't I didn't have a connect to the um, natural gas line right. that the district hooked up for us. Um, so yes, I would continue doing soda firing. I I think that. With everything in ceramics, you can just keep diving in, diving in, and that one is something that I want to continue to pursue. Every firing is different, unique, and there's so many recipes and ideas that I want to keep putting that into the the kiln and seeing what happens. Yeah, there's such a variable of flame and soda. Yeah, (laughs) and this larger kiln definitely fires differently. The pots are they look different. They feel different than the pots coming out of the first little kiln. Do you miss the I pots do. coming out of the first kiln? I do. And I, there was always this fear, like, am I going to be able to translate what I did in the small kiln to the larger kiln? And I got to a point after about seven firings in this larger kiln, and I said, let's, like, celebrate the positives in what this larger kiln's giving me and not try and chase something that this other kiln gave me is that what led you to doing some of those new experimental yeah. bodies of work yeah so the top of the kiln just got completely black yeah, and hotter. like it's it's a little bit hotter it's got more soda it traps carbon more so i had to develop something for the top two shelves and so that's a good challenge yeah and yeah. so do you still have your, your i do have the old one yeah it's here i could plug it in and and Fired up, fire up and probably get the same results that I was like chasing for. And that could be a good option because it's good to have a variety, yeah. you know, of surfaces. And so, yeah, yes, um, I would continue to pursue that. Yeah. I have a little 
kiln in my house at like one day I want to maybe maybe turn this other thing maybe uh, okay James Estrada James Estrada Pottery another high school ceramics teacher uh, how and when do you incorporate your studio time into your normal teaching day um, my studio time happens when I stop teaching and I stay at work now most often I I got over this like idea that I don't want to make things at school but I realized if I go home, the distractions are too great where I, if I just stayed at work for a couple hours and worked on mugs, I could put them away, go home, be with family, and then come home, come back the next day and trim, add handles, decorate. Like there, there's a nice flow that happens right after work because right. I'm already here. Um, you know, you, you ha I have the space, I have the, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I teach all day. And then I work for like two hours after school. Not every day, you know. Yeah. And you Sometimes I at, just want to go home. Do you work at home a lot? I do work at home. So I'll do my recording at home. I'll do a lot of live videos at home. Um, I, I would say like it's 80% here and 20% there. But I'm developing the home studio into more of like a recording studio. So. Cool. And it's hard to transfer pieces. Especially with the milk diffusion. You don't have a kiln at your house? I don't use the kiln. I have a kiln. I don't oh. use it. Uh, yeah, because I'm producing most of my work here. And so. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. yeah. Um, Noam Grown, Parker Koshine, one of my former students. He asks, when did you first find out about milk diffusion? Or how did you discover milk diffusion? Yeah, so Robin Hopper had a little, uh, well, he had a whole video series. And part of that video series was slip, uh, slip decoration. And in that little clip, it showed mocha diffusion. And I was like, what is this? I've never seen it. We studied ceramics in, yeah, yeah. in college and learned about it in high school and never heard about this like little technique coming from England in the late 1700s, early 1800s. in um, and this, this little, you know, surface decoration uh, I was so intrigued by and I just knew that there was something there that I had to continue to pursue and I, I felt kind of silly doing it and I don't know why at this point it's like just do it you know and, and have fun with it but I just kind of thought that people in the ceramic community wouldn't accept it as like a legit surface treatment and I I don't know I, I wanted to do it well and I wanted it to be my own creation mm -hmm. And I didn't want it to look like what other people had done and where it had come from. Of course, it looks like trees. It looks like fireworks and stars or whatever. Better so better. so I was like, I love nature. <clears throat> I love landscapes. I love just being out in nature. Mm -hmm. So I incorporated or pulled that into my work. And so I, I developed a way to make it look like a tree growth. And then I wanted atmosphere instead of it being static on a slip, I wanted it to kind of have depth. And so I incorporated flashing slips and soda firing and, and that's kind of how it all evolved. evolved into my current body of work. Do you, I think, you guys, I think you told, I heard you say it before, but you know what, you wanna tell us the, like how mocha diffusion was discovered? It was like the, uh -huh. spit, the spittoon or something? Yeah, you know, there's- I just think it's an awesome, gross story. <laughs> the, the theory is just that, these um, these workers in this factory making uh, mocha ware, they were putting a bunch of colors of slip all over the, the pots. And so I'm sure there was slip kind of everywhere. And they were chewing tobacco and they would spit and they would see maybe a tobacco would hit uh, a pile of slip and then it kind of just spread out from there because tobacco juice or water will uh, grow on top of uh, wet slip because of the acidic and alkaline uh, interaction. Like the contrasting of the two things? Or? Yeah, it's scientific yeah. Um, and also um, the surface tension that happens and yeah. kind of splits and breaks into these fractals. Yeah. Um, so at that time, they were selling and trading uh, mocha stone or dendritic agate. And it it's nature's kind of, uh, or it's just, it's just a, fractals in stone and so they would polish them off and and they would have these cool looking stones and they would trade them and and sell them and and it was kind of a hot thing and so mm -hmm. I, my 
readings and my interpretation is that uh, the people in the mocha ware factory saw this happen on slip and they're like, hey, that looks a lot like that stone. Let's try and incorporate this into our pottery. And so they did a few, they did the trees and the seaweed and the kind of bursts on their pots. And I still have yet to collect or, or have one of them as my own, but I would love to um, eventually own a piece like a mug that has, yeah, they were using earthenware, so there's not that many around. And then to get a good one, you have to pay the extra, yeah. you know, it's probably over a hundred dollars. I mean, like 1700s? 17, 1800s, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I imagine they're probably pretty. Yeah, they're collectible. They're collectible, expensive, yeah. and I want the right one, the look and stuff. So yeah. eventually I'll get, sure get one. Uh, Parker, uh, Gnome Grown underscore, oh, ask another one. Uh, how and where, how or where did you come up with the landscape concept for your work? Yeah, so from the, the mocha diffusion, just looking at it and realizing if you turn a pot upside down and you let the mocha diffusion flow down, it looks like a tree or seaweed and when you put it right side up. Is that an original, when you first started it, were you like, I'm gonna make landscapes or did I, it just kind of evolve? When I first started, I just kind of dumped it on pots and let yeah. it flow down and th those are really cool. I, I enjoyed that process, but I wanted to take it to the next level and I created a line in a cylindrical mug, a cup. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's that'll be a landscape line or hills, and then yeah. I'll allow the trees to grow up yeah. from that. And so holding the pot upside down, I had to create a landscape so that there was no slip down there. Right. Um, so I'm holding it upside down and then pouring the slip just right above that landscape, allowing the, the trees to grow um, down and using gravity and, and tilting it. And uh, I, I'm sure you're gonna show a video right now of yeah. what, what that looks yeah, like. I'll show multiple videos. And then it freezes and then you put it right side up and it looks like trees on a landscape yeah. or underwater scene. Yeah, cool. So that's where that, and, and at first I didn't want the, the landscape to be carved. Right. So there's a difference between carving and kind of forming what I do. Or, yeah, but that's just the corner of a rib, right? Yeah, so I use kind of a, um, a cut off metal rib of death and I create an even more sharp angle and like dangerous uh, element to that rib. And I press into the cup as it's moving slowly on the wheel. And I, I'm not removing too much clay. What I'm doing is just like molding or, or sculpting yeah. the bottom of it. Uh, it's taken a lot to develop that. And when I show that at workshops, um, I always say it's going to take 100 pots to really yeah. get that technique down. Yeah, the pressure and the movement, mm -hmm. the timing of the wheel, the timing of your hand. Yeah, yeah. There's so many. It's like it's un. It's not unteachable, but yeah. it's kind of in one of those unteachable. Like I can show you how to do it. Yep. I can tell you how to do it. But you need to like practice, practice, You need to do it practice. yourself. For yeah. and some people will probably catch on quicker than. And others. when I, if people really want to do it, I say, okay, throw a tall cylinder. That way, you have multiple levels that you can practice that technique. And so you can do it at the very bottom, and then kind of move your move your yeah. rib up like a half an inch and then try it again and also the speed of the wheel yeah. um but for for me i i needed this kind of hilly landscape and that was like the best it, it evolved right. from a line to a kind of sculptural bottom have you ever added clay for the landscape part or you always just kind of pushed it around um I think at one point I've, I've added, tried. yeah, I tried. another step. Mm -hmm. It's another step. Yeah. And I wanted to do it in wet clay yeah. so I didn't have to wait to do it. Um, There's a lot to say about efficiency. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not a technique that's new. Right. It, like pushing a tool into clay as it moves around is not something new. It's just, I use those ideas to create my own kind of version of, yeah. of a landscape. That's what we all do. We all kind of, Pick and choose our uh, pick and choose our uh, what works and what doesn't work, and put it all together. Uh, next question is from Magical Maguk. Maguk, what are some of your favorite assignments in school and general art assignments too? So I guess I don't know. As a as a teacher, do you have a, a favorite assignment that you yeah. like to do every? So I mentioned being in Taiwan, and one of the things that I loved and picked up on was the tea culture in uh, in Asia. 
I love making teapots and I love showing how to make them. And I do a tea ceremony. So I bring in a bunch of teapots and tea, loose leaf and, and bag tea. And then I have um, all, all the cups and little teacups that I've collected from other people. And then I serve tea to my students. And I tell stories about my time in Taiwan and I talk about tea and I talk about the form and the function of a teapot. And that's one of my uh, favorite uh, lessons that I get to teach my students. I think they really appreciate it because it's something different. They walk into the classroom, the tables are switched around and you know everyone's like, oh, what's going on? And I'm like, well, I just told you yesterday we're gonna do a tea <laughs> ceremony, but <laughs> you know, high schoolers don't always remember things. But uh, I get to show off that process and I think it's a good transition into making a teapot. And then they also see the value in making a good functional teapot because then of course, they can use the it. Yeah. 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 There's so many elements in a teapot that yeah. are super challenging in, yeah. in the best way possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's kind of answered it, but mm -hmm. if you want to get into a little more, um, sheets pottery. Uh, Nathaniel Sheets asks, what made you choose soda firing for your cups? Yeah, so the, the surface, uh, what, what it looks like with the mocha diffusion was really important. So I, I looked at Gail Nichols' pots before I was doing mocha diffusion, and I just fell in love with the surface. And I said, I want the surface because you're not adding glaze. You're just using the atmosphere and the, the soda mixture, baking soda in the kiln to create, and the way you fire it, uh, to create a surface. And I said, I want to try that. So I tried that. Uh, I wasn't getting Gail Nichols results, but I was getting something. And then Mocha Diffusion came along. And so I, you started soda firing and then Mocha Diffusion came? Yeah, oh, okay. I would say within a week. Oh, wow. Like I had <laughs> That's built, an important week in your life. I had built this kiln. <laughs> Um, and I, I was trying out so you were kind of searching soda about. firing and then I also figured out this like surface decoration of mocha diffusion and then I just kind of did it together but kind of separate and then I, I recognized early that those two will combine together really nicely to you create. You documented all that on Instagram, right? Yeah, on Instagram and then I was looking at an old Periscope video that I converted to a YouTube video which is private but I watched... Um, me talk about my my voice or whatever and i was talking about how it was soda firing and mocha diffusion and then i showed this one cup that i still have is that that video is on youtube it's on youtube but i'll share it with you can i put it in the yeah thing? I'll, I'll, I'll put yeah it in. that'd be cool yeah i started working and then i just kind of threw whatever in the kiln and um then I started discovering this mocha diffusion thing, and I said, "I want to, I want to try and do that mocha diffusion in the soda firing." And if you follow me on Instagram, you, you've probably seen this one, and how it's getting a ton of atmosphere or depth. Yeah, thank you. How's it going? Hey, Jen. So I love this. Um, and you know what, this is something that I'm striving for. Um, it's, a, it's a mug I still, or it's a cup I still have, and it shows the mocha diffusion with atmosphere, like depth. Yeah. And like this kind of moody uh, trees and, and sky and, and landscape. So that was like the first success that I had with combining those two together. And do you still so, have that cup still? Or? I do. Yeah, I have that one. Yeah, that's cool. Um, last question is from ab.ceramics, Alex. Alex. Uh, when is your soda workshop? Oh, when is your soda firing good. workshop happening? So I am planning it for October, um, uh, in 2019. Yeah. So one of the things about building this kiln was I wanted a larger, um, kiln so I could put more of my work and other people, the communities work in. Um, I am now going to start offering kind of classes or workshops to the general public and have them be able to work or put work into uh, the, the kiln. So that it's not, I mean, this kiln is, is not my own, it's the schools. It, we use school money to pay for it and um, it, I want it to go back into the community yeah. and and having access to a soda kiln around here is very rare yeah so it's exciting to kind of share that with people and 
and give it give students and um, people interested in clay an opportunity for a different surface. Yeah, it's cool. Um, it's so, really cool to have the atmospheric firings because yeah. I feel like I've described going up in such a like gas kiln, yeah. electric kiln. Yeah. When I was in junior college, we did like I did one or two soda firings or salt firings, but it wasn't anything we did regularly. So mm -hmm. it's definitely exciting to kind of see how these things are developing here. Um, that's kind of the last question. Uh, do you have any plugs you want to like? Uh, plugs. Oh some man. Of your workshops and your social media. Yeah, stuff? I would say uh, KowalskiPottery.com is going to be the place to look for where I'm workshopping, um, when I'm selling new pots, and then also uh, kind of just more information about technique. So I do have free information on there yeah. about mocha diffusion yeah. and soda firing that I do. Okay. I have to kind of update it, but um, that's, that's the hub of where uh, you can start and find everything else. And, and then, then Instagram at Kowalski Pottery, yep. YouTube Kowalski Pottery. That one might be a little challenging to find. I think it's Mr. Kevin Kowalski. Um, I'll look. I'll find but, it and I'll put it there. But I have links from my website too. Okay. My yeah, I'll put it all. Channel. I'll put it all in there. Mm -hmm. And then ClayShare.com is. I'm an instructor on there, so uh, go check that out. Use the link from my website because I get a kickback if you if you join and sign up for it. Um, I get a little kickback as as a way to Reference. like promote yeah. it. Yeah. And then your workshop in San Francisco. Yep, that'll be in date. September 21st and 22nd. Okay. And then in October, uh, I am going to be offering a workshop for the soda kiln in Orange County, California. So if you're interested, interested. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for doing this. Of course. Uh, Plays a four-letter word. Thanks for listening and watching. And uh, cool. I'm excited to see this uh, develop. Me too. watching or listening to my conversation I had with Kevin. Uh, it was a lot of fun uh, catching up and kind of seeing where we are moving forward. Uh, thanks to uprinting.com, I got my stickers printed. They printed them a little off center, so I let them know they're sending me new ones. So I'll have a bunch of stickers to do on a giveaway. So stay tuned on my stories on Instagram at Ryan Wright Ceramics and at plays a four letter word. And I'll be giving away a bunch of stickers. Um, I appreciate the feedback I've gotten the last week. Uh, this is still kind of a new thing. And I'm trying to figure out audio issues and video issues. But mostly audio issues. But and it's not perfect. But hopefully the content is worth listening to still. And I'll promise it'll get better. Um, if you can review and subscribe, that's very much appreciated. If you're listening to this it's now available on overcast along with itunes Sp spotify stitcher google podcasts anchor fm radio public breaker and pocket cast special thanks to kevin kowalski again for being my guest uh, a new episode next tuesday follow at clay's a four letter word and at ryan Wright ceramics on instagram also on facebook if you have questions for future guests i'll be posting it on my stories the day before uh, my name is Ryan Reich. Thanks again for hanging out with me and my friend Kevin Kowalski. My bud, Kevin Kowalski. We always call each other bud. And uh, this is Play as a Four Letter Word. Thanks. <laughs>